Okay, so we have uh, got ourselves into another virtual Hong Kong Green Drinks. Welcome everyone and uh, looking forward to having this uh, chat with Sean Millen today on World Otter Day, which is Yay. Yay. <laughs> exactly. And thank you Salvador in the background of my place deciding to get excited as well. Um, and oats. So the fun of doing live with animals. What are the rules about anything, you know, in terms of photography, don't ever do kids and animals. And here we're talking about otters and trying to get them on film. Um, Shan, I've known for a few years in uh, both when she was in her working, and I'll let uh, Shan explain what she was up to previously before her study work. And also we're both part of uh, helping an organization called Mazarang Hong Kong, which looks at animal rescue recovery work in Indonesia and reforestation work and uh, linking that from Hong Kong people down. So I'll hand over to you now, Shan, to uh, have uh, fun of explaining Otters of Hong Kong. Great. Thank you, Marin. Um, hi, everyone. And thank you for joining today. And happy World Otter Day. Um, World Otter Day was uh, started by a charity in Scotland called the International Otter Survival Fund back in 2009. And it started as Otterly Mad Week, which was a week of um, events to raise awareness about otters. And since then, it's evolved into World Otter Day and it's celebrated every year on this day. So events are taking place. Oops, sorry. No. Just uh, trying to move to my next slide. Here we go. Events are taking place globally because there's actually 13 species of otters worldwide. And they occur on every continent except for Antarctica and Australasia. So Hong Kong this week is part of a big otter celebration. So most of those 13 species are actually threatened by humans and um, most of them have declining populations in the wild. And you can see that around half of them are actually endangered or vulnerable on the IUCN red list. We actually have four species of otters in Asia. Uh, just let me see if I can put my interruptions. Here we go. So we actually have four species. We have the Asian small clawed otter. They're actually the, the smallest of the 13 species. And um, they tend to be the species that you see in zoos. So if you've been to Ocean Park and you've seen the otters, this is the species that you've seen. We also have the smooth coated otters. They're the largest otter of um, the four species in Asia. And if you are familiar with the otters in Singapore that are running around the city in Singapore, that is the species of otter that they have there. There's also the hairy-nosed otter, which is actually quite a rare otter. It's restricted to Southeast Asia and it's now endangered. And we have the Eurasian otter. And this is actually the species that is present in Hong Kong. It has the widest distribution of all of the 13 otter species. So it's actually the same species that you see in the UK and in Europe. Its range includes some parts of Northern Africa and it extends all the way across Asia. So the Eurasian otter was actually once widespread in Hong Kong and we know this from the natural history literature. So there are actually records of otters going back to the early 1900s in Hong Kong. And they make reference to otters being on the coasts of Lantau Island, Hong Kong Island, on the east and the west coast of New Territories. So it was actually once widespread. However, from about the 1950s onwards, the otter population started to decline in Hong Kong. And we know this from the sparsity of records in the natural history literature. So they started to say things like, oh, otters haven't been seen for many years. And some were actually stating that they thought that otters were extirpated from Hong Kong, which means locally extinct. But then in the 1990s, there was a few sightings, but nothing concrete. And then a dead individual was found in 1995. So we knew that they'd managed to persist here in Hong Kong. 
Since then, there have been various sightings and some occasional records, but there hasn't been um, a comprehensive study to investigate that. So there's been this decline in numbers and a, it's resulted also in a contraction in range. So the core population is now concentrated up in the Northwest New Territories near Shenzhen. You can actually see Shenzhen here in this picture. And then on the other side of the river is Hong Kong. So the area that the otters now um, are mostly persisting in is this big fish pond area. And if you're familiar with the Hong Kong wetland park, there's a lot of fish ponds um, on, around that and they extend all the way up to the border with Shenzhen. And so this sort of semicircle here is the Lok Ma Chao Loop. So this is sort of up at this end. That area um, doesn't only include commercial active fish ponds, there are also many abandoned fish ponds. Uh, it's right on the coast, so there are um, mangroves and intertidal mudflats. There are big areas of reed beds, and all these habitats are interspersed with watercourses and rivers. And all of these habitats are important for otters because they not only need the um, aquatic water bodies, uh, habitats and water bodies to forage in, but they also need dry land as well so that they have places to rest. And the females also need undisturbed areas to raise their young. So all of these habitats are really important. So at about the same time that Hong Kong was seeing declines, there were also historical declines of Eurasian otter in other countries. And this included the UK and Europe. And although the reasons for those um, are not entirely um, uh, understood, that one of the big contributors that they thought was um, important was um, the release of pesticides and organochlorines, which includes things like DDT and dildren um, in agricultural use. And these uh, pollutants are washed into the waterways or water bodies where um, uh, fish and aquatic invertebrates um, bioaccumulate them. And then when these are eaten by the top predators in the food chain, then we can start to see these knock-on effects and negative impacts. So since then, though, there have been um, other, other impacts that might have been going on as well was habitat loss, um, hunting of otters. So there was a, a number of factors going on, but they think that the pollution was a big factor. But since then, there has been a banning of hunting. There's also been ban of banning of some of those pollutants and the water quality has improved. And you can see here um, in the surveys that have been undertaken for England that there has been recovery of the population over time. So you can see a very sparse um, population density and then the otters are starting to expand into the areas where had, they had been lost before. So this is great. And this is also happening in Europe. In some countries during that time, um, otters became extinct from some countries such as the Netherlands, Belgium and Switzerland. But otters now are starting to um, come back from the adjoining countries and um, we're seeing population recovery. But here in Hong Kong, our otters have, numbers have remained low. Otters are considered to be a rare species and they're considered to be a species of conservation concern by AFCD. Um, they are considered to be endangered in um, the China Red Data Book uh, and there has been significant decline of all three species which occur in China. Um, so it's not looking great for otters in Hong Kong. When you um, want to try to understand what has been causing these declines, um, having an understanding of the ecology and um, the threats that um, the species is facing is really important. And in the UK and Europe, there has been a lot of research done on otters. So there's a pretty good understanding of 
their ecology, they have established methods for how they go out and survey for otters, they've set up um, national surveys to monitor them. They understand the threats that they're facing and they have worked out standard mitigation practices to help alleviate the pressures on the otters. However, in Hong Kong, because there hadn't been any um, significant research, we had a, a lack of this type of information. We didn't know how many otters there were. We didn't have a clear idea of what their actual distribution was. Um, we didn't understand what habitats are important for them or what resources are important for them or even what threats they're still facing here. And without that fundamental information, it's quite difficult to make um, effective management decisions to conserve a species. So in 2016, the University of Hong Kong embarked on um, a study to learn more. And this has been my PhD study. So the aims of the study were to um, estimate the population size, to work out what that distribution actually is, and um, to understand which of those habitats are important and what resources are important for otters in Hong Kong. Also to understand the threats. But studying otters in Hong Kong is challenging. They're rare, their numbers are now really low. They're a nocturnal species, which means that they are active at nighttime and they're elusive. They're very shy of humans. They have excellent uh, senses of smell and hearing. So they often know that we are there long before we know that they're there and they've disappeared. So they're quite difficult and this is also a factor of why um, not many people in the general public know that otters are present in Hong Kong. So we can't just go out and count them. We need to use different methods to um, collect our data. And some of the ways that we do that is by collecting um, or searching for otter sprints, which is a fancy term that we give to Eurasian otter poo. So we can look for otter sprains, we can search for um, otter footprints, we um, can search for otter scratchings, they have quite a unique scratching that they do in um, mud, muddy areas on the banks of rivers and on ponds. And we can also look for otter paths, which are basically well-worn areas that otters are frequently moving along. And in both of these particular um, pictures, you can't see it, but there is a sprint um, within this tunnel, grass tunnel and over this embankment as well. So the otter sprints can actually be quite variable. Um, they can be solid and um, kind of typical of what we would expect of um, an animal's scat or poo, but they can also be um, just a black smear. Um, they're also sometimes just clear jelly-like, uh, so highly, highly variable. But one thing that they have in common is their smell. And it's not actually as bad as you might think. Um, their smell is quite a fishy smell, um, but with a hint of freshly um, cut grass. So if you are an ecologist and um, you need to do a study searching for a carnivore's scats, a Eurasian otter is not a bad uh, animal to be studying. So the sprints can tell us a lot about the otters. Um, firstly, obviously, if we find a sprint, we know that an otter has visited that area. Um, so it starts to help us to build a picture of the areas that they're using and of that broader distribution. We can also use the otter sprints to work out the population estimate. So if you imagine when um, a, an otter eats and the food moves through its digestive system, some of the cells from the otter's digestive system pass out with its sprain or its feces. Um, that 
DNA in the cells that pass out with the sprints can be collected and analysed. The problem with um, this technique is that for carnivores, um, the DNA that comes out with their faeces can um, be of low quality and of low quantity. So when we go out and we search for the otter springs, we have to find very fresh otter springs, and that means they were deposited the night before. So we go out very early and we search for the otter springs. The otters are, um, I mentioned, uh, oh, they're, they're a solitary species and they're a territorial species. So they use their sprints to communicate with each other. They leave them in quite prominent uh, locations, such as on top of a rock or a log or some other feature, generally near the edge of a water body or um, a water course. So we go out, we search these areas and try and find them. We collect the fresh sprints and we take them back into the laboratory where we can process them with um, solutions and chemicals to extract that DNA. From that, we can work out the individual of the otter, if that uh, is in the way, um, uh, the individual of the otter that deposited that sprint. So, um, we look at the DNA combinations to work out the individual, and we can also work out the sex of the otter, whether or not it's male or female. So then once we've analysed all of our different sprints, we can take those different genotypes, different individuals, and we plug that information into a computer program, and it can estimate the population size for us. So, this is um, a technique that we've been trying to use. Um, we're at the end, finally, of, um, of doing this. It's been very, very challenging because it's been hard to find the fresh springs. And also I mentioned these difficulties in um, analyzing the carnivore DNA, but we're almost there and we hope to be able to share this um, information with everybody very soon. So the springs can also tell us about otter diet. This is quite important because otters are a food limited species, which means if the food resources decrease in an area, the otters can be impacted quite quickly. So it's important that we understand what they need to survive so that we can manage those resources adequately. It's also particularly important for the Hong Kong otter population because it's now concentrated in a human dominated environment. These people are living and working here and seeking a livelihood from these fish ponds. So it's important that we understand what the otters are actually eating. In those other countries that have seen decline of otter populations in the past, such as the UK and Europe, now that that otter population is coming back, they are starting to see human otter conflict, particularly in areas where there are fisheries. So there is this competition or assumed competition between the otters and um, recreational fishermen and also uh, commercial fish farmers. So we know that this can happen in the future. So it's something for us to be thinking about um, for our otter population recovery into the future. So how does this work? So the springs, the really solid ones, are often jam-packed with bones and fish scales. And you can even see a little circular thing here, which, which is actually a fish eye. Um, and what we can do is clean up these springs, dissect them out, and identify the species that the otter has been eating. Now, of course, we need a database to actually be able to work out what these species are. And we've been putting this together, um, which has included fish bones and fish scales from the study area. And you can see a few examples of the different types of fish scales of the um, fish species from the study area. So again, we're almost at the end of um, this part of the study as well. We are finding um, 
that the otter's diet is dominated by fish, which makes sense. But otters can eat other species as well. So they will eat amphibians and reptiles, mammals, and even birds. But obviously, I think that because of the resources in our study area are um, so fish dominated, it's just an easy um, source of food for them. So again, this is something else that we hope to be able to share with everyone in the coming months. And for those of you who are familiar with our Facebook page, the Hong Kong Otters Facebook page, you will know that we also have infrared cameras out in the study area and they um, are set up to trigger whenever an animal moves in front of them. So they've got motion detectors and heat detectors. Um, we have them running 24 hours a day and they've been running for a couple of years now. So we have collected a lot of data. And this um, has included behavioral data as well as information about the habitats that the otters can be found in. So here we have um, a very glamorous shot of an otter sprinting. You can see the sprint down here. This is classic behavior where they point their tail up and um, we often know that they're sprinting from um, this particular uh, behavior. The otters also like to groom. They, they don't have very much fat to keep them warm when they're actually foraging in the water. So they have this really remarkable fur. It's a double layer of fur which helps to insulate them and keep them dry but they must keep that fur in tip-top condition. So they spend a lot of their time grooming and looking after it, and they have favorite places to do that. So we've identified a number of grooming sites, which is really quite lovely to see. Um, and one thing I should also note, and you, you'll be able to tell from these photos, is that most of our photos that we pick up um, are taken at night time, but we do get the odd otter, which is um, uh, photographed during the daytime. But this tends to be quite early in the morning. Another um, wonderful thing that we pick up is um, mothers with juveniles. And um, here you can see the mother in the background and her two juveniles. They're estimated to be about six months old. They're in good condition and looking quite healthy. So this was a really exciting to know that otters are breeding, that there are safe areas for them to rear their young and that um, we can see population growth. We also pick up um, all of the other wonderful wet land wildlife. Um, we are picking up leopard cats, um, which is also nocturnal, but we pick up the odd leopard cat also during the day. Um, they have lovely patterning. You can see the stripes on what we would call their forehead. They have a flash of white on their tips of their um, ears. And of course, you can see the gorgeous spots and stripes on the rest of their fur. We also are picking up the um, small Indian civets, which is also nocturnal. Um, you can see those big eyes that they use for being active at night. They have the wonderful bars on their tails and the stripes on their back. And very occasionally, we also get um, a, a nice shot of one during the day. And here, this one is actually scent marking. It's like cocking its leg on the back of this post here. We also pick up the Asian mongoose which are one of my favorite because they've got real attitude. Um, these ones are active during the day. So because they're active during the day, often when people think they've seen an otter, they've actually seen a mongoose because that's when we tend to be out there as well. But the mongoose are actually half the size of an otter. So a fully grown Eurasian otter in Hong Kong is um, just over a metre long. So it could be up to 1.2 metres from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail. Um, so they're, they're quite large animals, but the mongoose is about half that size. So much different. And then, of course, we picked up an unusual image of a macaque in the wetlands. We're not quite sure what it was doing there. And we also pick up a number of snakes. This is a Burmese python um, and also the wild boar. So a whole range of different species, which is quite nice for us to go through all those images. And also 
because that wetland area is um, located where it is, it's actually really important for birds. So we have the Maipo Nature Reserve up there. There's um, a Ramsar site, which is an important site for overwintering migratory birds. So we pick up a range of um, different species and um, we've been quite lucky with a lot of the images that we find. So this is just sort of a, a bit of an outline of um, of our research. Uh, we will be finishing up the study later this year. So um, we hope to then be able to um, use the data that we find to input into a management plan for otters in Hong Kong so that we can um, go forward with some um, uh, practical um, management um, options for otters and based on the information that we find. So um, in the meantime, we will continue to update everyone on the Hong Kong Otters Facebook page and um, yeah, stay tuned and um, we hope to bring more information. Um, lastly, we have had incredible support from um, many organisations and people. Um, tonight, I'd like to say a special thank you to Merin and Hong Kong Green Drinks, um, as well as um, the Purpose Business for hosting um, this presentation. We're really, really grateful for everybody's support. Uh, thank you very much and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Cool. Thanks, Sean. Well, you've been... Uh giving us a good presentation there. There are a couple of questions popped up there. Um, I see Mark's put up uh, one question in there. I think it's Mark Harper's M. Harper in here. I've got the wrong M. Harper in there. Um, lots of hikers and people doing stream trekking in Hong Kong these days. One, what role for citizen science in alerting researchers to suspected otter signs? And two, what should trekkers do to prevent impacting on otters negatively? Uh, Mark, feel free to come in and add to it after you hear Sean's um, response to those questions. Um, well, if you do come across um, a, an otter scat, that's probably um, something that you would recognize most. The footprints are quite difficult. So an otter footprint is um, about the same size as a large dog, but they only have four toes. An otter has five, and a good way to remember is a bit like a human, but sometimes the fifth one doesn't show. Um, they can also have a little, you can show a little bit of webbing between their toes, but it, they're quite difficult to, um, to distinguish. So the best chance of um, finding a sign of an otter is through its scat. And if you see something that you think, wow, that's full of bones, or maybe it's an otter scat, have a smell, um, be brave, that does it, they aren't disgusting. Or if they're really fresh, if you can see that they're moist, don't inhale too much because you might get a bit of a shock, but have a sniff because, and then take a photo, feel free to send it to me and I can have a look and, and get back to you. But I will ask you if you smelt it. So um, please do have a smell and send in anything that you think that might be ottery. Um, I can generally have a bit of an idea. You could even collect a little bit of it, wrap it up in something and I can have a look at it as well. Um, and, and just record where it was. Um, at the moment we are not posting locations on the Facebook page. And this is because otters in Hong Kong were hunted in the past. And um, they are still, uh, there's still a potential for them to be hunted um, within the whole of China, mainland China and Hong Kong. So we try to be quite careful. We also um, don't want a lot of people racing out there all excited and disturbing them. Part of the reason for this is there's not many of them. So we want to give them a really good chance not to be disturbed and also to um, ensure that they have the best chance of recovery in the future. So if you do find something, feel free to get in touch with me, but try and collect as much information about it as you can. To make sure that you're not impacting otters negatively, I think, um, as I said, you know, uh, not mobbing areas where you think that otters might be. Um, particularly 
if if it's a case where say there was a mother with her young we don't want to be disturbing them we want to give that that juvenile the best chance of survival as possible oh thanks Sean. That, um, yeah he hasn't typed any other questions in that and that one but another person tracy's got have you seen any otters yourself in hong kong or only on the camera and i'd like to add to that how close and how often if you uh, let's say researching them, uh, whatever word, you know, how often you get to prod and poke them when yeah. you are capturing them and how, how are you capturing them if you're capturing them? So. so I have been doing this study since 2016 and I um, am out there almost every day during the winter when I was collecting my samples. I have not seen an otter with my eyes in the wild in Hong Kong. So there are people who have seen them um, and they have, have let me know because we are also collating other people's records as well so that we can have this ongoing database of records. Um, but I haven't seen one. Um, but I have been in the last couple of years to some of the big um, otter conferences and many people who've been studying them for even longer than me also haven't seen them. So it doesn't make me feel so bad, although it would be really, really wonderful to see one. Uh, I have um, been lucky enough to spend some time with the Asian small clawed otters in Ocean Park. And um, I've, I've met some other um, otters uh, through my journey, but none of the wild otters in Hong Kong. But it also gives you a bit of an idea of how rare they are now and how elusive. Um, but hopefully in the future, as those numbers increase, we will have more opportunity for those chance sightings. And in places like the UK, people do see them quite regularly. And as they um, the numbers have increased, they have become more... Um, habituated to being active during the day, which is um, a bit more conducive for us to see them as well. Cool. So uh, the good news of this as well, you haven't had to kind of visit one at the veterinary clinic at Kadori Farm or somewhere like that either. No, no. Which is good that they haven't been all of that. Um, <laughs> another question coming in there is around population size. What is the rough, rough idea or can you share anything on that um, size? I think at the moment it's it's too early to tell and I don't want to be um, too presumptuous about it. I have my feelings about it and um, it is low, but I am reluctant to put a number, a number on it, but I'm hoping that in the, in, you know, the next few months or so, we will have a much better picture based on the science. Okay, cool. Uh, question about uh, interacting with the local fishermen when you're chatting with them and that, what's their kind of attitude, you know, mm. how's it going in terms of, is they concerned about the competition? So um, as part of the study, and I didn't talk about it today, but um, we did do a big interview exercise of um, the fishermen, of people living and working out in that study area. We interviewed over 200 um, fishermen or people, but most of them were fishermen. They um, were really amazing. Many of them were um, getting on in years, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. They'd lived in that area for a long time um, and they had this wealth of knowledge. So some of them had lived there since they were children. They were able to tell us about how there were a lot more otters when I was a child, but I haven't seen them for 10, 20 years. Um, the vast majority of them, at least three quarters of them, when I ask them what has happened with the otter population over the time, they all say it's declined. They have seen this while they've been living there. Um, when I asked them what they felt about otters, many of them were quite positive about them. They, they, they liked them. But if I asked them, should they be managed um, for their conservation, they started to get a little bit cautious and um, they weren't too sure. And you can imagine in the past, they know that the otters eat their fish. So they, they kind of, they like them, 
but as long as they're not eating my fish is sort of their attitude. You know, they rely on these fish ponds for their livelihood. So this is where we start to get a warning sign that if order numbers come back, which we hope they will, how can we find this balance between people's livelihoods and conservation? And we can learn a lot from what's happened in other countries and apply that here if we can understand what the diet is. I'm, I'm not sure that I mentioned to you that um, some, you know, we are getting a bit of a picture of what some of those fish species are that they're eating. And they're not, um, there are non-commercial species and some of them are even invasive species such as tilapia. So, if we can start to work out what the otters are actually eating, we can then go and speak to the fish farmers and inform them of this and hopefully help to minimise the potential for human otter conflict into the future. The work with them, I think that's really important that they're involved in the future management of the otters. And you can see how they get worried if it's special species coming in what won't they also be allowed to do so it's that natural reaction for them a um, couple of questions I'll blur them together a bit um, what's the species in Singapore where the comment is that they lucky seeing them in Singapore so just a brief reminder of that and if you wanted to flick back to that picture of the different species or not sure. what's going on in the Pearl River Delta in general um, mm -hmm. and, or is that also a massive information gap um, is there other colleagues doing that or what's just the more China angle on the otters? Um, I think that's the two main things to come out. The other part is about more getting into development concerns around pollution development, all that type of thing. So, um, Singapore, uh, yes, extremely lucky to be to see otters in Singapore. So the Singapore story, there's a couple of um, interesting things about that. Otters were actually once extinct in Singapore. Um, then after about the, from the 1960s onwards, they started a campaign of cleaning up their waterways and improving the aquatic habitats. And um, in about 1998, a pair of smooth coated otters, the largest otter species in um, Asia, came across the strait from mainland Malaysia and they established in Singapore. Since then, the otter population has um, improved significantly. Uh, the otter population is now expanding across Singapore, those species are um, a group species. So our Eurasian otter in Hong Kong is solitary and very shy of humans and nocturnal. The smooth-coated otter in Singapore is um, a social species. It lives in big family groups and it can habituate to being around humans and in that city environment. So that's why they have these wonderful opportunities to see the otters there. But it is a wonderful success story about how if we alleviate the pressures on otter species they're very resilient they can make a comeback and so if we can use the science and learn more about our otters here in Hong Kong we hope to see something um, in terms of population recovery as well. So leading that through then is the basically cleaner water means more species in the water so that means they've got more to eat and having open canals rather than covered in drains so that it's more natural environment so that all kind of converting from concrete stream canals back into natural beds that kind of yep. development so I was just very into that was linking in a couple of questions but also yeah. back to the where's the other nearest population or what's going on in the Pearl River Delta for otters as sure. maybe the last question Okay, I'll just add to, to that as well about the water quality it's also about the pollutants as well and how they physically affect the otters as well um, so the Pearl River Delta. So it's um, Eurasian otter had a large range through mainland China as well. You, most people will probably know that um, Shenzhen has seen massive development over the last 20 to 30 years. And that's also included um, habitat loss of their um, coastal vegetation and mangrove vegetation and things like that as well. So they, um, they have lost 
quite a lot of their wetland habitat. There is still um, an, a, a little wetland park not far from the border of Hong Kong and Shenzhen, um, Fujian Nature Reserve. Um, and it's possible that there are still otters there and that they're perhaps moving between Hong Kong and um, that reserve. Uh, but I think that within the Pearl River Delta, all of that development has not been um, good for the otter population. And we know that throughout mainland China, there has been significant declines in all three species. Uh, so, and they're all now endangered in mainland China. So um, that hasn't been great, but there needs to be more research. And um, the, this is something that Kuduri Farm, there, um, is doing a lot of uh, research in China on a number of species, including otters, and they're big advocates for training up um, uh, people over in mainland China to help them to do surveys. So um, there is now growing momentum, and um, Kaduri Farm is doing a lot of great work over there. Cool. Uh, Anything else you want to share to wrap up? I think so. We covered most of them. No one's kind of pushed another question up and we're just running at that time. It was targeting around 40, 45 minutes today for our chat. So there's one more quick question. Fire it off now. But uh, Sean, anything else you wanted to share or we wrap it up there? I might just um, mention just about the Shenzhen and Guangdong area. Um, so whilst we might assume that you know, the otters um, have struggled there since all that development. We did find a newspaper article that um, someone had found an otter there in 2013 and it was rescued. So, you know, sometimes they do pop up. So, you know, we shouldn't give up hope. And I think that um, if we can um, improve habitat connections, and um, work collaboratively through the Pearl River Delta to um, enable movement of otters and a large um, area of, of habitat for them because you know they are these big animals, they have massive territories. So we need to make sure that there is enough habitat to support a good population. So um, I think working together and um, you know, collaborating and, and improving the broader area, not just Hong Kong, is really important. And they're not a sea species and they're not a land species. So we come back to the classic in Hong Kong of managing across multiple departments when you're going from land through mangrove out into open ocean, that we need a lot of that broader, what might be just called wetland area supported and used. So thanks, Sean. If people have other questions, of course, they can get involved by the Facebook page for Hong Kong Otters. And um, we'll make this uh, recording available both in Hong Kong Green Drinks and uh, in the Hong Kong Otters group as well. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining in. And uh, let's hope that the research to give us population numbers and a bit more insights comes out soon. So good luck with writing all that up, Sean. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>